seventh Sunday after Pentecost. Epistle is taken from St. Paul's letter to Romans chapter six. Brethren, I speak in the human way because of the weakness of your flesh. For as you yielded your members as slaves of uncleanness and iniquity unto iniquity, so now yield your members as slaves of justice unto sanctification. For when you were the slaves of sin, you were free as regards justice. But what fruit had you then from those things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of these things is death. But now set free from sin and become slaves to God, you have your fruit unto sanctification as your end, life everlasting. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is life everlasting in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Gospel. It's taken that according to St. Matthew chapter 7. At that time Jesus said to his disciples, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. By their fruits you shall know them. Do men gather grapes up from thorns, or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree beareth good fruit, and but the bad tree beareth bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. And he who does the will of my Father in heaven shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Those are the words of today's Holy Gospel. So the day we arrive closer to the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Christ has been speaking all the summary of the Gospel. And as you're getting closer to the end of the Sermon, the latter part of the Sermon, He speaks of these, Beware of false prophets. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. St. John Chrysostom tells us, he says they, well, they wear sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. And he tells us that we are all meant to be sheep, and sheep always wear sheep's clothing. So some from this passage that we say, Beware of those that wear sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves, begin to despise or be afraid of their own sheep's clothing. But remember that not only do the wolves wear sheep's clothing in order to deceive the faithful, but the sheep must also wear sheep's clothing. Therefore, we should not despise sheep's clothing. And then also, though we should not despise sheep's clothing, and we should look for sheep, sheep are supposed to look for other sheep and live amongst other sheep and be with the sheep. At the same time, there must be a certain awareness, which is why our Lord Jesus Christ says, Take heed. He does not say, Look and see. But rather, he says, take heed, because you cannot look and see the wolf when he is dressed as a sheep. But you can still tell if there is a wolf inside of the sheep's clothing by taking heed. By taking heed and watching not the sheep's clothing, but something else. Since the clothing of the sheep that is a real sheep and the clothing of the sheep that is a false sheep look the same, we will not be able to tell by the clothing. First, says St. Augustine, what is the clothing of sheep? And what is the clothing of a wolf? For some wolves travel in wolves' clothing. Other wolves go under the guise of sheep. What is a wolf's clothing? And what is a sheep's clothing? The sheep's clothing, says St. John Chrysostom, the sheep clothing, it is the prayers and the fasting and the almsgiving and the intentions that are seen by men. When you see a man walking in a cassock, or you see a man walking in a church, or you see a man kneeling in prayer, you see sheep's clothing. Or when you hear the words, Lord, Lord, that is mentioned at the end of the Gospel today, 
When our Lord says, Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. And again, notice he says, Not everyone. Some from this passage say, Well, since if you say, Lord, Lord, then you're a hypocrite. Obviously, everyone who is a follower of God must say, Lord, Lord, and must pray to God in public as well as in private, and must let it be known that he is a follower of God. He must be seen on his knees. He must be seen uh, it, it, it doing the works of God. But yet it seems those, many of those that say, Lord, Lord, and many of those that pray, and many of those that do alms deeds, and these external good things, will be seen to be sheep when they are wolves. And others will be seen to be sheep when they are sheep. The sheep's clothing are the external prayers. The sheep's clothing are kneeling in prayer. The sheep's clothing are the air of sanctity, the air of holiness, the air of spirituality that one carries about. Now this is not to be seen that one is definitely a sheep. When you see holiness of behavior, and when you hear holiness of words, and when you see spiritualness of look, this does not mean that they are sheep. We must take heed. We must discern whether or not it is really a sheep or it is a wolf. Now there are some that are neither sheep, who are pure sheep, and some that are not sheep and, and, and wolves in sheep's clothing. And these would be like priests or faithful, who while they try to be sheep, commit sins. And while they try to be sheep, do mistaken things. Like for instance Moses, when he struck the rock a couple of times. Or David, when he committed sins. When David committed sins, they were sins of weakness. And when Moses struck the rock, it was a sin of weakness. And when he did these things, he in a certain way acted like a wolf. But he was not like unto a wolf. He was rather given over to the flesh. And therefore, the scripture says, there are sheep that are given over. There are some that are given over to the weakness of the flesh. But these are not the ones that Jesus Christ speaks of in the gospel today. There are those that are dressed in sheep's clothing and inside are ravenous wolves. These will be found inside of the church. And they will be found from the beginning until the end of time. They will always be wolves in sheep's clothing. And since there will always be wolves in sheep's clothing, it is necessary for the faithful and the priests alike to keep their eyes upon the sheep and see, is this a sheep in wolf in, 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 a wolf in sheep's clothing, or is this truly a sheep? Do not despise the clothing, and do not despise the prayers, because all must say, Lord, Lord, and all must wear the clothing of sheep if they are going to be sheep. But many will be wolves. Take heed of these wolves, the ravening wolves, since we cannot see by our eyes, how can we see? And the Lord Jesus Christ says, By the fruits you shall know them. Do men gather grapes from thorns, or figs from thistles? St. John Chrysostom tells us what are grapes, and from whence do grapes come, and what is the sign of a fig? For these are the two fruits that come from Jesus Christ. Grapes, figs. Or rather, the one fruit comes from Christ, and the other fruit comes from the church. Now the first fruit comes from Christ, and this is the fruit of the grapes. For a grape, there are many bunches of grapes, says St. John Chrysostom, and they are clustered upon one piece of wood. One little windy piece of wood they are attached to, and this wood is the wood of the cross. And there are grapes that are attached to this wood. For wherever there is the wood of the cross, there will always be grapes attached. And where there is a wood without grapes, it is not the wood of the cross. But if you look at the wood with grapes, and you look at the wood without grapes, they look the same. And so how can we tell the difference between that which is the true wood of the cross, and that which is the wood of the stick of the cruel man, the stick of the evil man? or the stubbilly bat that is used in a bad way. The both sticks look the same, but by the fruit you shall know them. The grapes are not gathered from thorns, and the figs are not gathered from thistles. 
The grapes are the first fruit that are attached to the cross. And this fruit, says St. John Chrysostom, because there are three sides of this fruit. Now, first of all, grapes signify patience. That when there is the cross, the cross eventually teaches and those who are exposed to the cross, patience. Everyone in life says the imitation of Christ will experience the cross. The good experience the cross and the bad experience the cross. The lazy experience the cross and the hard working experience the cross. Every single human being who is in this life will experience the cross. Everyone is going to experience pain. Everyone is going to experience adversity, and not only the friends of God, but also the enemies of God. All will experience the cross. But which cross is the cross of Christ? And which one is a stick used by the devil to destroy souls? They look the same. But the first sign of the real cross is patience. Grapes are thrown into the wine press, says St. John Chrysostom. They're thrown into the wine press and they are crushed. And when these grapes are crushed in the wine press, they are patiently transformed into wine. And so the crushing of the grapes is a signifies patience. And then also, it becomes wine. And what does wine do? The second sign of the cross of Christ is joy. Because Psalm 103 tells us, Vinum nativicet cor hominis. It's one of those verses that all seminarians memorize. The wine rejoices the heart of man. That wine gives joy to the heart. And that one of the effects of wine is joy. The first is patience. And after patience comes joy. That when we experience the cross of Jesus Christ, when we are in contact with a soul that has experienced the cross of Jesus Christ, there shall come patience. There shall be an awareness of patience, and then there shall also be joy. There is always joy in the cross of Jesus Christ. And then the third sign is sweetness. As the wine ages, it gives a greater delight. As the wine ages, it tastes better. And so likewise, as we live longer in the cross, when we live longer with the cross of Jesus Christ, it creates patience that becomes greater. It creates joy that becomes deeper. And it creates a sweetness that is seen in all of the saints. But it creates a sweetness. And this sweetness is an effect of this cross of Christ. And then secondly, the figs. The figs are the church. They are the fruit that comes from the church. And St. John Grisodom tells us, the figs are sweet. The grape is not sweet at the beginning. It becomes better only after you turn it into wine. But the figs are sweet from the beginning. And the figs are a sweetness that surrounds many seeds. Like the church, which goes out with love. The church is the bride of Christ. The church is a woman. And the woman always goes out with love. And the woman is always going out looking for the bird with a broken wing. Always looking for something that is in a state of sorrow and sadness. And it is going to heal and pick up that thing. That wounded bird. Or that wounded creature. And it is going to envelop it with love. And so you will find the sweetness of the fig, says St. John Chrysostom. The sweetness of the fig surrounds all the seeds. And it protects all the seeds. And these are the seeds of the faithful that are taken up. That are brought in to the church by the fruit of the love that comes from the charity of the church. By the fruit you shall know them. Man does not gather grapes from thorns. He does not gather figs from thistles. The grapes and the figs come from the cross of Jesus Christ and our Holy Mother, the Church, in her work of charity. We must look at the fruits. And what are the fruits that are to be found today? What are the fruits of, for instance, our present crisis of the Society of St. Pius X dealing with Rome? What is happening? What are the fruits of the behavior of Rome with regard to every single group that has gone under the, 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 the protection of Ecclesia Dei. Every one of them has been smashed by the stick. Every one of them has been crushed. Every one of them has been changed 
Every one of them has been lied to. Every single one of them. The most recent being the Good Shepherd Institute in 2006. Priests that left us only a few years ago. And now they're told in 2012, what we told you five years ago, six years ago, it's not true anymore. We told you we would leave you alone. We're not going to leave you alone. We told you you could preach whatever you want to preach. You cannot preach whatever you want to preach. And so on March 23, 2012, Monsignor Pozo told the superior general of the, of the, of the uh, Good Shepherd Institute, who was just removed from his post last week, they told him, you must accept the Latin Mass in the spirit of Simonum Pontificum, which means you must accept the new Mass also. You cannot say that you're only going to have your Latin Mass. We said it was okay five years ago, six years ago, but it's not okay today. You must start teaching the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the new modernist Catechism of 20 years ago, in your seminaries. You must start teaching the 16 documents of Vatican II in your seminaries. And if you don't do this, trouble will come. And they appealed to Rome. And that was in March and April. Now in July, the superior has been fired, he has been removed, and they have a new boss. And this has happened time and time again. What are the fruits? The fruits are the destruction of tradition. The fruits are deadly to the souls. And we look at now, how is the church, how is Rome? The Pope must convert. Pope Benedict XVI must convert. He's pulling down the iron fist upon the, so those that do not accept every detail of Vatican II. And yet he says, on the one side, you don't have to accept every detail. On the other side, he smashes. And at the same time, at the exact same time, he's telling us, we are welcome you with open arms. And we want you to come inside with open arms. And we accept you as you are. And we want you to help us. But if you do not do exactly everything as we say, we're going to excommunicate you again. We are giving threats. These are not the ways of Christ. And what are the fruits throughout the church? Souls exiting the church still throughout the entire world. Souls abandoning the truth of Jesus Christ. The fruits are deadly. Souls are abandoning Christ. Now the majority of Catholics do not believe the Pope is infallible. The majority of Catholics do not believe that Jesus Christ is body and blood and soul and divinity in the Blessed Sacrament. Just a few months ago, I was speaking to a priest who says the Latin Tridentine Mass, who seems like a very holy priest. We had a very good conversation. He says the Latin Mass. But he was saying in the Diocese of Manila in the Philippines, every priest is pretty good for the most part, even though they're a little bit modern. And then I told him, I said, Father, I was in Manila in the Philippines at the time. And I told Father, I said, you must admit that in this diocese of Manila, and in every place, there are many priests that do not believe in the real physical presence of Christ in the Blessed Sacrament. And that priest told me, I don't believe in the real physical presence of Christ in the Blessed Sacrament. He is his priest that celebrates the indult mass. He celebrates the Latin Tridentine mass. He said, I don't believe in the physical presence. I don't believe he's, that Jesus is bodily in the Blessed Sacrament. I think he is only there a really. There's a real presence. A real presence, but not a body presence. His body is not there. That's what he believes. We have a grave crisis on our hands, and the crisis is getting worse. And the answer to this crisis is the preaching of the cross of Jesus Christ. The answer to this crisis is that which is going to save souls. And these are our sacraments. Not the sacraments that have been destroyed, the sacraments that have been watered down, the sacraments that have been transformed into modernist sacraments that are bringing souls away from God. Well, they refuse to anoint. And when they anoint, they don't even always use the correct olive oil. And they don't even say all the prayers. And they don't believe it's necessary for salvation to receive confession. And many priests to this day still refuse confessions. Many churches in the Philippines, they don't have confessions. They don't have them. 
Ten masses on Sunday. No confessions. Because everybody is already a saint. Ten masses on confession on Sunday. No confessions during the week at the cathedral of the town where I say mass. And then it says confessions by appointment only for those people that think they need it. And there are no appointments. What has happened? Souls need Jesus Christ. Souls need to be connected to Christ and they need the forgiveness of their sins. And without the forgiveness of sins, there is no salvation. And now we believe that we can go to heaven without any forgiveness of sins. And what is happening? Those that are remaining in the church are losing the faith. A priest who says a Latin Mass, who doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is in the Mass. What does he believe when he says, Hoc est in corpus meum? Why is he saying that? What does he believe? He's a very nice man. Smokes good cigars. He is very intelligent. He knows his theology. The first three hours discussing with this priest, I thought he was a very solid Orthodox priest. And then all of a sudden come out one heresy and then another heresy that he had disguised over the first few hours of our conversation. There is a grave crisis in our church. And it is leading to the loss of millions and millions and millions of souls. And what is happening? There is a crushing of those who want the truth. There is a driving of souls away from God. And it is happening now everywhere. And what is, what is the answer? The one stick, the stick of faith, the stick of the cross, creates patience, it creates joy, and it creates sweetness. But the stick of the devil has also three effects. It creates harshness of wounds. They hard, when you see that stick, it comes and hits you. It creates fear. And it, and it, it creates fear, and then it creates one that's going to run away from the, from the truth. I remember seeing in India the power of fear. Working in an orphanage and seeing an evil man operating in his orphanage and trying to control the evil that he was doing. But seeing the working of the stick, he had the stick. He was most cruel. He was extremely evil. And seeing the effect of the stick was very interesting. Looking at the young boys, they did not improve at all. Though they would receive the stick, they would be beaten for no reason. They would be beaten for a reason. They would be beaten if he was in a bad mood. And these boys learned how to survive under the stick. They would turn on each other. They would create little groups amongst themselves. And there are many victims. We worked amongst these boys when I was in India. The fact is that the stick of Christ and the stick of the devil operate differently. They do not work in the same way. The stick of Christ has a purpose. And that purpose is to drag souls and move souls unto himself. It is a stick of that, sure, that, that, that produces grapes, that produces fruit. When a father chastises his son, as it tells us what we must do in the book of Proverbs, a father that does not chastise his son despises him, says the book of Proverbs. Or, but it also says, a father should not provoke his son to wrath. On the one side, he must chastise his son, or he despises him. On the other side, if he strikes him too much, if he strikes him too quickly, if he strikes him too violently, then he will provoke his son to wrath, and his son will remain evil all his days. He will not be cured. I've already dealt with many sons of wrath. It is exceedingly difficult to cure a son of wrath. It is exceedingly difficult. We must not create sons of wrath. Bitterness created inside of souls by an excessive using of the stick. This is being done now. In the parishes it happens all the time. The modern priests say so many times, you don't do exactly what I say, I'm expelling you from the parish. I'm refusing you a Catholic burial. You can't get anointed. We're not going to allow you this, we're not going to allow you that. All the time they pull out the stick. Perpetually they pull out the stick. And this is now happening in the society of St. Pius X. 
Fifty people go to Mass in northern Mexico a couple of weeks ago to a priest who was a priest in the society. And they are told that they must confess going to that Mass is a mortal sin. And they are told they will be refused Holy Communion. And the one who put them up in the house, who put the priest in the house, was excommunicated from the parish and can no longer go there. Now in the past, our society teaching is very simple. All Catholics who are not sinners, public sinners, may come to Mass. All Catholics who are not public sinners may receive Holy Communion. Whether you go to the new Mass, or whether you go to the old Mass, or whether you're not going to Mass at all, we don't know. Anyone who comes to Mass and is not a public sinner, when they go to confession, that's between them and God. Remember what our Lord Jesus Christ, or rather it says in the Gospel, if a man takes the Holy Communion unworthily, let him know that he eats and drinks unto destruction. But we do not destroy. Let him eat, says St. Paul. But now we're going to pull out the, the iron fist. We're going to pull out the stick. But it is not the stick of the cross. It is the stick of the devil. The stick of the cross operates differently. The stick of the cross is one that creates patience. One that has a sweetness to it. One that is connected with joy. You see it in young boys. A young boy that is loved by his father. And he knows he's loved by his father. And the father spanks him. It does not harm the boy. He needs spankings or else he'll never grow a brain. But nonetheless, it does not harm the boy because he knows the love of the father. But if the same father were to whack him and without love, it would harm the boy. In everything that Jesus Christ does, there is charity and there is love. And we don't make new rules and we don't rule by terror. The new rule of the church is a rule of terror. And the reign of terror is now entering tradition. It is beginning to enter tradition. Threats are being made. This is not the way of Christ. Archers of Lefebvre was very simple and very clear. We preach the truth. We believe the truth. We say the Mass of all times. We condemn the errors. But if you do not want to accept that, that is between you and God. Those who come and benefit, let them come and benefit. Those who do not wish to come, let them not come. Each man has his own free will. Each man can make his own choice. We recommend that you don't go to the new Mass. We recommend that you don't go to a St. Evicondus Mass because they don't accept the Pope. We recommend that you don't go to a compromised situation. But if you go, you have to learn on your own. We don't know the grace that God has given you. You must learn on your own. We recommend the truth, but we do not condemn those that go to the new Mass. We do not condemn those that go to a St. Evicondus Mass. We do not condemn those that go out into the world. We tell them this is the truth. This is what's necessary for the salvation of souls. But these are difficult times. These are challenging times. These are times in which souls are in a state of confusion because our Holy Roman Church is in a state of confusion. Each bishop has a different teaching. The Pope himself can't make up his mind. When he prays, he prays with Muslims. He prays with Jews. He prays with pagans. He also prays with Catholics. And yet we know that the first commandment tells us we pray only to the true God and we don't pray to false gods and we pray only in the true Mass. And yet our own Holy Father is confused. And if the Holy Father is confused, it is most normal that holy bishops will be confused. It is most normal that holy priests will be confused. It is most normal that holy faith will be confused. It is the most normal thing in the world. Therefore, while we must speak boldly the truth, we must condemn boldly the errors, we must not be too hard upon the sinners. The way of the church is to be most harsh and most strict on doctrine and most clear on these things that are necessary for life. Like the mother that tells the child, this is poison, do not eat it. But when the child has eaten some poison and comes in with poison, you little brat, you ate poison. <laughs> she doesn't do that. She takes the boy to the doctor. And she gives them the antidote. And she tries to fix the child. Then when the child is lying in the hospital, she says, You see, this is what happens when you eat poison. So next time, be more careful. 
But when she's given the sermon on it, she doesn't do it like that. You eat poison, I'm going to kill you. Don't you touch any poison. But if the child does touch the poison, there is no violence in the mother. So likewise, we condemn boldly the poison of Vatican II. We condemn boldly the errors that are in the church today as Our Lady prophesied them. The Blessed Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, said in 1846 in Al La Salette, Rome will lose the faith in our 20th century, and Rome has lost it. It's in a state of apostasy. But when we deal with the Roman priests, we are friends with many of them. When we deal with the Roman priests, we do not deal with them with cruelty. The church is most strict on the error and most gentle on the souls. And this is the way of the church. And when we see a change, now we are seeing a change. We are not hearing a clear condemnation of the errors anymore. We are not hearing a clear communication of the truth anymore. But we are seeing the power of the new authority inside of tradition. We are beginning to see the great threats of the iron stick. Many people have to go and meet with their priests now because they may be doing things that are not approved. Many are being threatened to be removed from their positions in the parish. Others are being threatened from removal altogether. And these are the same experiences that we had in the 1970s. The iron fist and the cruelty of the action should not be there. It is necessary necessary that we follow the law of charity in our action and we follow the clear doctrine in our teaching and we condemn boldly the errors in our teaching but when dealing with weak sinners in these confused times we must be patient and we must be gentle if the priests are confused if the bishops are confused if the pope is confused then we should not be shocked that the people and the faithful are also confused we help clarify the confusion by saying boldly and clearly the truth which God has given to us. But at the same time, we must be patient. And then also, we pray that our Lord Jesus Christ and the Blessed Virgin bring quickly an end to this crisis in our church. Our Lady said that it will come to an end, but late. When the Holy Father consecrates Russia to the Immaculate Heart. When the Holy Father consecrates Russia to the Immaculate Heart, then Russia will convert. Something sacred about Russia. When Russia converts, then all the rest of the world will be brought back to a time of glory. But until the conversion of Russia, which cannot happen until the Pope consecrates Russia to the Immaculate Heart, there can be no victory. And between now and the consecration of Russia, we have to stand strong and stand firm in our faith. We must boldly condemn the errors of the, of the Council and the errors of our church today and the errors of the world today and then we must be patient, and we must wait until the time of God's own victory, which He will choose at whatever time He wishes, when Mary comes to crush the head of the serpent, and bring about the conversion of the world again to her immaculate and sacred heart and the sacred heart of Jesus. And we'll close that and I'll bless you all.